Hello everyone, and welcome to season three of London Lights. This is our first episode in season three, and our subject today is the great legendary London Free Press editorial cartoonist, affectionately known as Ting, everybody's favorite. My guest today is Deanna Tamlin. Uh, I have a short bio to read about her, so you, I can tell you what she's all about. Deanna is an award-winning artist and graphic novelist who's been actively writing and drawing comics for over 20 years. She's exhibited her comics at small press fairs and comic book festivals in both Canada and the USA. And she's had artwork displayed in various group and solo shows. In 2005, she was chosen by the Globe and Mail as a Canadian cartoonist to watch. She is a recipient of the Canada Council Grant, a London Arts Council Grant, and is the founder of the Ting Comic and Graphic Arts Festival in London, Ontario. She served on the Ontario Arts Council jury and curated the large gallery show, Words and Pictures, cartoonist from Southwest Ontario for Museum London in 2018. Deanna graduated from Concordia University in Montreal, and she's with us today to talk about the one and only Ting. Welcome, Deanna. Thank you. Good morning, Dan. We've talked about you, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about what it is you do. Uh, can you tell me, first of all, what is there a living for people these days who are cartoonists? What's that to like, and how does it work? Yeah, so that's that's a very good question. So there's uh, Ting, was an editorial cartoonist, which is uh, one type of cartoonist, which is you open the paper, you go to the editorial section of the paper, letters to the editor, um, and there's often a cartoon there, which is talking about what's happening today in politics. And this was a really popular feature of the newspapers for years and years. All the top newspapers had their own in-house editorial cartoonist. But the past mm, 10, 15 years or so, as their in-house editorial cartoonists would retire, they, we've got, only got a handful left. So I would say, and probably when they retire, they probably won't replace them. So I'd say for editorial cartoonists, it used to be a really good living. Um, it's not really a path forward anymore. So as a cartoonist, you can uh, do graphic novels, you can do daily comics, but uh, like anything else, it's a, uh, you know, it's uh, kind of lightning in the in a bottle. You better do it for the love of it because um, it's a slim chance that you'll be uh, another Merle Tingley. But all is possible. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's always optimistic hope. Exactly. But tell me about Ting. How did you find out about him? What were your first uh, exposure to his comics, his cartoons? And uh, how did you become a fan? I'm a Londoner. Grew up in, in London. Um, I think... Being from London, uh, growing up in London in the 70s and 80s and, and earlier than that, you, it would be hard to miss Ting in your daily life. So uh, my grandparents, for example, had a um, subscription to the London Free Press. And as people might recall back in the day, there was two editions of the paper. You'd have a mo uh, morning edition and an evening edition, weekend edition. And... Uh, my grandparents would read the paper cover to cover uh, every day, spread out on the breakfast table. And this was something that was not of interest to me. But there would always be a Ting cartoon. And uh, Ting would always hide a little uh, character, Luke Worm, which was his mascot, which is behind you there, who had, was like a little worm with a top hat and a pipe. And for a kid... Uh, the cartoons were always something that's going to grab you that you'll look for, but it was really an early Where's Waldo kind of game, where sometimes yeah. it'd be really easy to find, and sometimes it would be really hard to find, and um, it kind of drew you in, and I always loved comics, I always loved drawing, so that's something that you would look forward to, to actively look for in the paper. Lukeworm certainly drew me in as a, a kid in the 1960s. I believe Ting started doing the editorial cartoons in the 1950s. But when I would get the paper again, my parents got it 
Yeah. Everyone seemed to get a London Free Press back in the day. Exactly. And yeah, I went uh, first place I would go was that uh, Ting cartoon. Where's Lukeworm? And yeah. I remember the odd time he had done such an um, excellent job of uh, hiding that, uh, that worm. I have to ask my parents, I can't find the lukeworm today. Is he still alive? Exactly. Show me, show me exactly. lukeworm. And they would, they would give some assistance. And then sometimes you'd see uh, someone dressed as a lukeworm in the Santa Claus parade as well. Yeah. So he was like a real live character. For he was. Family. He was. And uh, I was reading, apparently the odd time he would forget to put him in a cartoon. And apparently the, um, the London Free Press switchboard would light up where people <laughs> would be angry going, oh, where, where is he? I can't find him today. Oh, and people funny. would even um, uh, somehow get a hold of the Merle Tingley's home phone number. And they would phone him there going, where is he? It's driving me crazy. I can't find him. <laughs> and apparently it was Merle himself who dressed up as lukeworm in the Santa Claus parade. He was a very yeah. funny guy. <laughs> well, someone told me a story about, it might have been Herman Gooden, uh, about uh, uh, Ting uh, marching in the parade as lukeworm. And some kids got so excited they wanted to feed a banana to him and shoved it in the mouth of the character wow. <laughs> and uh, Ting had to march the rest of the way in the parade with the squishy banana in the costume. That's funny. Um, but he was a real, uh, he was on the London radar. He was a real London character. Ting as an individual, a warm, compassionate individual. And his cartoons were just excellent, second to none. Of course, there's the lukewarm that the kids uh, would appeal to the kids. But his cartoons themselves would often have commentary about things that were happening in London at the time. So what's the history of Ting? How did he get started on this career path? And how did he hook up with the London Free Press? So Ting was actually uh, born in Montreal. And um, in the Second World War, he was um, a cartoonist for a paper called Khaki, which was you know, to help the morale of the troops and to get across information to uh, the soldiers. And he would do kind of a regular strip in that. So he did that during World War II and um, also worked for the, the Maple Leaf, an overseas newspaper. And after the war, he really, um, he'd been doing his cartoons for um, all the war years. And he really just wanted to be an editorial cartoonist. So apparently the story goes, he hopped on his motorcycle with like a portfolio of his uh, war cartoons to hit every single newspaper and to get a job, went from place to place, uh, didn't get anywhere. Everybody turned him down. And he had a friend in London, Ontario, who said, look, I can get you a job at the London Free Press, but like we're talking in art department and photo retouching, but at least there'll be something because at this point he was broke. <laughs> and and uh, he said, okay, he showed up for the interview and they said, okay, how, what do you know about photo retouching and we need an expert in this? He's like, yeah, 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 I, I'm, I can do all of that. And apparently he didn't know any of that. So uh, he got the job and... Uh, um, was in the art department and then he just did a cartoon submitted it to the editor editor liked it and after that he became the regular cartoonist so he was there for 38 years doing wow. uh, a cartoon a day for uh, all those years and was one of the most beloved parts of the newspaper and then london free press was a big paper so his uh, cartoons were syndicated to 60 other newspapers. Wow. So that's a quite a, ride, a wide reach that he would reach across um, Southern Ontario, but even across the country. And yeah. he would do, as you say, uh, one cartoon per edition of the paper. There were six yeah. editions uh, during the week and a morning and an evening paper as well, as you say. Yeah. So his career spanned 40 years. I mean, we're talking... 42,000 different cartoons and the quality of his work. So impressive. I mean, I, you, I don't want to put others down, but sometimes you see some of the editorial cartoons today 
It looks like they might have been slapped down in five or ten minutes. But uh, Ting's work was intricate. It was very detailed. And I understand we just had the passing of our Her Majesty the Queen in, uh, mm -hmm. in Britain yesterday. And one of the first cartoons that uh, Ting did was uh, King George when he was uh, uh, became king of, of England. But he didn't use the caricature of George the King. He used the caricature of the London mayor, George Winnegy, I think it is called. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and that was typical Ting. Uh, he would take the day's events and uh, put a spin on it that made it just such an enjoyable experience, something you look forward to seeing in the paper each and every day. You're, you're exactly right. And um, yeah, apparently he would, uh, but as an editorial cartoonist, you really have to be up on the news and know what's going on. So his son says he would listen to the radio all day. He would read uh, magazines back to back, Maclean's, uh, whatever. And he would struggle during the day, his um, fellow staffers would hear him apparently groaning and kind of tearing his hair out while he's trying to think of the idea for the day until he he finally got it and would have put it down. But yeah, that's a lot of pressure to come up with something every day. And he was a very good draftsman. You're, you're right. Yeah, excellent. Mm -hmm. uh, one example, uh, I, I attended the London Club recently mm -hmm. and hidden away in the men's washroom is a big ting cartoon. And it shows... Uh, uh, our, one of our mayors, Mayor Bigelow, mm -hmm. uh, first female mayor in London. She was not allowed to go to the London Club at the time. It was men only. Yep. So Ting did a cartoon of her, like Joan of Arc, uh, on a horse outside the London Club, ready to storm the gates of the London Club and gain access. And that was so typical. He would he would tap into those current events and put that into a cartoonish form that really made a good strong point. Yep. Yep. You're exactly right. So between being in the paper every day and, um, and, and then he designed the whole look of everything at Storybook Gardens, he did the map of Storybook Gardens, he did um, a coloring book for Storybook Gardens, he had, uh, they would put out a collection of his cartoons every year in a book format, which sold very well. Is this the one I inherited from my uncle Bill Mailer? Yeah, yeah. So that's that's an example of one of them. Yeah, that was 50 cents back in the day. Cartoons by Ting from the pages of the London Free Press. This one from the 1950s. And uh, just packed with uh, great little cartoons of events happening in London. And uh, if you can get your hands on that, viewers, you should try and find some of those and use bookstores or something. Uh, Deanna, we're going to take a short break. Just sure. hang on to your thoughts and we'll be back in a couple minutes. Viewers will be right back to talk about legendary editorial cartoonist Ting. Stay with us. All right, we're back on London Lights with our guest Deanna Tamlin. We're talking about the legendary editorial cartoonist for the London Free Press, the man known affectionately as Ting. His works will live on for ages and ages. And just on that point, uh, Deanna, can you tell me where are Ting's 42,000 cartoons? Did they go <laughs> into the trash heap or uh, has somebody saved them somewhere? We are fortunate in that uh, Western has uh, uh, large archives as part of their library. And they have hundreds of his original drawings in the archives. So, um, you can make an appointment and and see them and request them and uh if you want to have an art show you can ask special permission to see if you can borrow them to put them on display so that's something that we're really lucky to have uh they're well taken care of they're filed filed nicely and uh they're here in our own backyard i think there's some in ottawa as well mm -hmm. now you mentioned storybook gardens and of course, anybody that grew up in London, uh, Storybook Gardens, again, was a huge uh, place on the map of London, a memorable place. It still, of course, uh, uh, exists today, but its heyday really was in the uh, 1960s and 70s, I think. 
Mm -hmm. after Slippery the Seal escaped from his tank and made his way down the Thames River all the way to Ohio. Uh, So international attention came to Storybook Gardens. And you mentioned that Ting was involved in that. Herman uh, Gooden has written an article on Ting, which I believe is available online, called The Civic Blessing and Inspiration of Ting. It's just a beautiful uh, article that I think does justice to Ting, but he talks about storybook gardens, and here's what he said. Other than decades worth of cartooning, one of Ting's most enduring gifts to London was the charitable work he performed for storybook gardens, which first opened at Strawbridge in 1958. Ting offered them his services and ended up designing nearly 50 booths, exhibits, and displays, all of it for free. Wow, I I had no idea he did that for free. We wouldn't see that today. No, it doesn't surprise me, but I had no idea. Yeah, wow, that's quite something. Yeah. It mentions he hadn't taken a penny for any of the design work. Wow. He even handed over the rights to the storybook coloring book. And uh, that's real community service. I mean, uh, Ting, I think, epitomizes the kind of uh, civic uh, leader or individual that just makes... a a tremendous impact on the community, one that I'm not even sure he was able to appreciate. And uh, to your credit, you wanted to make sure that Ting was recognized. Can you tell me about how the festival came to be? So I'm an artist and a cartoonist myself. So having somebody like Ting in our own backyard, who's so visible as a cartoonist, as you say, you see him every day in the paper, Um, You go to Storybook Gardens and you're literally surrounded by his creations of uh, Jack and Jill going up the hill of all these fairy tale stories. And um, he would do the maps for City of London. He he was all over the place for 20, 30 years. So um, I'm from London, went to school in Montreal, lived in Toronto for a while, came back to London. just over 15 years ago, and I was trying to get kind of reintegrated in the community, see what was going on in, in the arts, and found that there's a number of really prominent cartoonists, illustrators from the London area that nobody knows were here. They tend to be a, a shy, shy lot. Ting wasn't shy, but I had this idea that I wanted to shine a spotlight on some of the um, the talent in our backyard that people didn't know w- was in our midst. Good for you. And, yeah, and my husband happened to be working at Parkwood at the time, and he came home one day and he said, "Somebody, I told someone that you're a cartoonist, and they said you might be interested to know that there's somebody at Parkwood, and he is a very famous cartoonist." And I said, "What?" He said. And uh, said, Merle Tingley is in, is in Parkwood. And I thought, wow, I had no idea. Because we, after he retired, we didn't hear from him for, for a while. And I assumed he was no longer with us. But I thought, oh, my God, I have this idea for a show. I think we can pull it together around Ting because he is probably our most visible, famous cartoonist. And if at the same time we can honor him, And so that he can know that he is very beloved and still thought about and still an inspiration to um, younger cartoonists, I think that would be fantastic. Mm -hmm. So I approached um, the Arts Project, which is a gallery in um, downtown London. I pitched them the idea. They thought it was great. We went to Western Archives. We picked out like 20 Ting originals, hung them alongside uh like 12 kind of contemporary newer cartoonists and uh call it the ting comic and graphics arts festival and we were able to have ting as our guest of honor at the opening reception wow fantastic and um his son brought him and everybody was so nervous it's like i hope people come i hope people come i hope this is a success and it was a huge turnout you said you were there Dan I don't know how many people were there a uh, couple hundred maybe oh and- yeah when I heard about you doing this festival I thought you know what I've got two young boys I want them to meet Ting I know he's an older yeah. gentleman people don't live forever if they have a chance to meet him and shake his hand 
to me, that was a huge thing because I told them about Ting and I told them about Lukeworm and down we went to the festival on Dundas Street. And yeah, yeah the place was packed. It's and uh, I couldn't see Ting. All I could see were huge groups of people <laughs> and it looked like they were surrounding somebody. And so like, we get up closer, we looked over the shoulders and they're seated in the middle of this huge circle of humanity is Ting. And he's yep. warmly greeting everybody. He's got the smile on his face. And we just waited our turn to get in there. And I took a photo of my son, Lucas, uh, shaking hands with Ting. And you can see the warm smile on his face that he loved children. And he loved uh, the fact that the people were out to appreciate him. And you did a wonderful thing with that. He was in a wheelchair at the time, not in the best of health. And we were hoping he would be in good shape for the day, which he was. He has always loved the party, apparently, uh, uh, life of the party. And um, we couldn't, it, we had a hard time moving 10 feet into the gallery because uh, he was just surrounded with people right away. And people came from uh, out of town, from Toronto, I think some from Quebec, and neighbors and co workers and colleagues, and lots of people like you who, and lots of people had books for him to sign. And it was, it was a true rock star. And uh, his son was um, overwhelmed, and he was overwhelmed in, in, in a really good way. There was lots of tears that were shed, but it was completely a fantastic evening. And he was there for well, two and a half hours. So I think his son is like, okay, dad, I think <laughs> this is a lot. I think we got to call it a night. But also at the event, um, the cartoonist Seth, who was one of our most famous cartoonists, um, actually became a cartoonist partly because Merle Tingley came to his school when he was um, uh, eight or so as a as a guest artist and um, was a big inspiration for Seth. So Seth gave uh, some remarks and um, then uh, inducted him into the Canadian Cartoonist Hall of Fame right there that evening with, uh, with uh, a medal. And um, yeah, it was a fantastic evening. So the, the only thing that Ting was sad about is there were so many people, he wasn't able to have a good look at the other artists' work. Oh, wow. So he is, he is very, um, just a, a, a gentleman that we don't see as much anymore. So he said, I, I had a great night. I would like to go back because I didn't get to see the other artists work. So he arranged to go back later on in the week, spent a couple hours in the afternoon to see the other artists work. I think I was telling you, social media was apparently lighting up saying, hey, Ting is in the gallery right now. If anybody has time on their lunch, go, go down and see them. And apparently people were running down the street, leaving their work to try to catch them and uh, shake his hand and, and say hello. So uh, super happy that that happened. Well, it's just a wonderful thing. And you know, the fact we're having this program may attract more interest to Ting and his work. Uh, are you continuing the festival and when will the next one be so people yeah, can go there yeah. and have a look? So that was the first one in 2014 and it was a, we didn't know how it would go. It was a huge success and we've had it every year since then. So we've had an interruption over COVID. However, um, we're going to be having it again in 2023 in the spring. It's always during May. This will be our seventh one that we do. And every year we still have, we have a full wall of um, teen cartoons and we handpick them to be kind of relevant to what's happening in the day, which is not that hard to do, I'm afraid. So you can take something from the 60s and... You mean downtown construction? Uh, there's da construction on Dundas Street. And <laughs> 1950. Waiting, 1960, for, the, waiting for the train in your car. <laughs> What's well, listen, uh, you said road. Seth was there. You mentioned there's been other great cartoonists from, from London, Ontario. Southwestern Ontario is just a fabulous hotbed of talent for comics and, and illustration. And um, we try to highlight 10 to 12 artists every year at the festival, at the at Ting Fest. Um, we have a big black and white photo 
of Ting in his office that greets you when you come into the gallery. We have a wall of Ting. And then some of the artists we featured in the past have been Seth, as we mentioned, and Jeff Lemire, who's from Essex County. He, um, Netflix has done an adaptation of one of his graphic novels called Sweet Tooth. And CBC is doing a show of one of his graphic novels right now, as we speak. Uh, Brian Lee O'Malley is from London, Ontario, of Scott Pilgrim fame, and we've had him uh, as a guest in a signing where he drew hundreds of people as well to the gallery. So, um, yeah, we're very fortunate in London to have a lot of talent here. It, it's exciting to hear that Ting was an inspiration to someone like Seth and mm -hmm. others. Would you encourage young people today to consider a career in animation and cartooning? Oh, definitely. I mean... What we have now in the in the show is we have artists from video game companies. Um, we've got yeah, graphic novelists, illustration. Um, got somebody in London who regularly does illustrations for Vanity Fair, different magazines. I mean, it's still a viable career. Yeah, definitely. Great. Well, Deanna, thank you so much for being with us today to talk about Ting. I'm just tickled. Uh, that we were able to do this because Ting was one of my reasons for starting London Lights. I wanted to talk about him and, uh, and draw some attention to him and his tremendous work. So I think you've done that in an admirable way today. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Dan. Thanks for taking the time to be with us. And viewers, stay with us for more episodes of London Lights for season three. It's, it's good to have fun. you here and everyone take care. <laughs>